Welcome to Transcendent Psychotherapist. This is just a brief intro to an interview I did earlier today with author Heather Hamilton, who's written a book fairly recently published called Returning to Eden, uh, a field guide for the spiritual journey. Fascinating interview and a fascinating book um, that Heather gives us where she explores her revaluation and her new understanding of spirituality, having come from a uh, a very conservative fundamentalist background and she draws on depth psychology the work of Carl Jung and the writer all about kind of myths um, uh, Joseph Campbell to get into the sources of Christian Christian faith and Christian spirituality with a different approach looking at the kind of richer meaning rather than just a kind of literalist um, interpretation of Christianity so I won't belabor the point literally follow along see what Heather has to say and see where it might inspire you I'm Heather Hamilton I'm the author of this book here uh, returning to Eden a field guide for the spiritual journey and yeah I'm um, a mom of three kids we live um, you know in the Bible Belt uh, the south of the United States and um, it's a very grew up evangelical, just very immersed in that whole ecosystem. It, it's very much like the dominant culture here. Um, so yeah, it was, that's really my whole background. There's not anything super remarkable about it. I think I sort of articulate um, maybe not a universal evangelical experience, but one that's very common mm -hmm. that I think a lot of people will resonate with in the book. Um, and then you know, long story short, we can get into it, but I just, I had a spontaneous, intense mystical experience um, while my husband was, we were both, you know, very involved um, in a local, very large church here. And it, it was very disruptive um, <laughs> to, to everything, not just the worldview, but our whole life. Um, and so, yeah, while that was going on, it, I, you know, it's interesting, a lot of people who go through like a deconstruction process or something, I don't know, my, I've heard lots of stories, you know, I stumbled across something and this didn't make sense. And, you know, or I didn't understand how evangelicals were supporting Trump or something like that. It was, it was kind of um, maybe started off a little more rational. And for me, it was, it was an experiential thing. I wasn't, trying to go down like a rabbit hole it was like a clash <laughs> with um with reality that um sent me spiraling and um yeah it just it forced me to reconsider the whole thing and come to a new understanding of um what in the world <laughs> this religion and um all religions really were trying to say and so that was my goal with the book was um to really, uh, I don't, I don't know if I should jump into it this quickly, but um, help Christians and even people who are not Christians to understand Christianity as a language, and you know, if you are a practicing Christian, to understand what your language is actually saying, mm -hmm. um, and then also to maybe like diffuse some of the allergy or repulsion to Christianity that some people have again, by introducing it as a language. Obviously, it's been used to like abuse and dominate and and all of these things, but just in its pure essence, help people understand what it is um, and how it's, it's relevant to the individual and collectively. Um, but in the in the book, I spend a lot of time focusing on the individual and the psyche because I think it has to start there. Um, and if we go collective first, I, I I think it can it can get distorted very quickly. Thanks, Heather. Yeah, and I guess also I guess because I mean, the majority of listeners on this channel are in the states. Obviously, I'm in on the other side of the pond in the UK. Mm -hmm. I mean, just for I guess for our British viewers as well, it's a it's quite a different um, church culture. I suggest probably mm -hmm. um, in the UK on the whole. I mean, we've got. Uh, there's a strong kind of evangelical conservative 
kind of set of Christians around. We've got quite a lot of liberal Christianity as well, mm-hmm. although we're a much more secular nation, even though we're kind of, in theory, uh, kind of a, a Christian state because the what's now King Charles the Third will you know will be on in a few weeks' time um, is the head of the Church of England. You know, it, it's a kind of different ballpark here, mm-hmm. um, but. Yeah, it's interesting. When I grew up myself in a kind of conservative evangelical Baptist church, which is a bit different perhaps in the UK than it might be in in the US, but kind of really resonated with that need that you look at in the book to reconsider particularly the kind of texts of Christianity, the, the, the Old and New Testament, but to rethink things in a in a less literalist manner and that's a kind of mm-hmm. we'll get into it obviously but that's a big part of the book and obviously as a psychotherapist someone who who's you know f- familiar with with Jung's thinking um a lot of what you said there in the book resonated as well so Jung and Joseph Campbell mm-hmm. in terms of mythology ideas um yeah so should we should we jump in with kind of I'll just give you a quote from your own book yep. <laughs> that you, you would have heard um so and we can get into that journey for you a little bit more so you write near the beginning the christian well this is from carl father carl rayner um the christian of the future will be a mystic one who has experienced god for real or he he or she will not exist at all so just tell us a little bit more about that journey from you know conservative evangelicalism to um christian mysticism if it's fair i don't know even if you Mm -hmm. describe yourself in that way but yeah yeah um yeah so so my um introduction to the church was when i was a young child probably six or seven um and it was i don't know if if over in the uk y'all are familiar with vacation bible school um but it was those kind of environments where you know it's you know very focused on children um you know games and memorizing bible verses and that whole thing. Um, and so I was, you know, quote unquote saved when I was seven and it was always a very, um, it was a very like sincere thing for me that was, uh, really driven by me. Uh, I know a lot of people who grow up in a religious environment feel like, you know, I didn't have a- autonomy o- over this and, you know, my parents drug me to church or, and, mm-hmm. yeah. and I've seen that a lot. Um, and it's interesting cause that really wasn't the case for me. It was, when I was young, at first, my family didn't go to church and I would, you know, the church bus would come pick me up um, on Sunday morning because I wanted to go, you know, Mm -hmm. tell my mom like, hey, schedule me on the bus. And then I would ride for like an hour to the Sunday school or whatever. Um, And so that was really how it started. And then eventually, like my family did start coming. um, And we moved around quite a bit, like in the South. And every time we would move, it was me, you know, needing to find my youth group and my people and, and all of that. Mm. Um, so I have an interesting perspective on it because, you know, um, I think for people who are coming out of religion or have a lot of resentment about it, um, it might get directed at family or whatever, you know, like if my family hadn't taken, hadn't indoctrinated me into this, then, you know, all this wouldn't have happened or whatever. Um, but I do think that kids have a need, um, and you can maybe speak to this as a psychotherapist. Um, I needed a I needed a black and white, orderly explanation of the universe. Like mm. I, I think for a lot of kids, they do need that psychological safety of this is just the way it is, and this is right and wrong. And so, for better or worse, I mean, there there was like a lot of indoctrination that happened that I you know, internalized a lot and took it way too far. But um, I do think as a stepping stone on my whole journey, I can look back and see like, oh, that was for better or worse. It it was a foundation that I unconsciously, you know, I wasn't conscious of it, but I needed it. Um, and so, you know, that was that. So anyway, grew up um, and just always, yeah, always just took it very seriously. It was, you know, I was interested in, um, journalism or whatever, but it always had to have like this missional focus to it. You know, it was like, oh, here's, here's some of my passions and interests, but I really feel like 
you know, God told me to be a missionary when I was 12, you know, so I just can't deviate from that plan. So it was a lot of um, this always like struggle back and forth of, you know, what's God's will for my life and trying to figure out what that was. Um, So anyway, um, that was, I think, kind of the me wrestling for my whole life. Um, And then I met my husband um, at the church. We had three kids and we were just very involved and, um, you know, we, we were leaders in the church. So it just kind of felt like, um, you know, we followed the quote unquote narrow path <laughs> that actually a lot of people follow, you know, it's not so narrow, but, um, we, you know, we were making good decisions and wise decisions, following God, blah, blah, blah. And so this was, it turned out pretty well, you know, like here's the reward. Um, and so, um, fast forwarding to, um, I was 32, had just had our third kid and I essentially just had some major revelations about my life, my own trauma that I had never named or even recognized that was there. And once I saw it, it was like, um, this volcano that exploded. Um, and I had just a complete identity crisis. And um, this was very disruptive for my nervous system. I had never, you know, struggled with substance abuse or addiction really. Or, I mean, looking back, I I can say that there were probably periods of depression, anxiety, but nothing that was ever like chronic or long term or that had ever been like named for me. And suddenly this was like a complete psychological descent into, um, what I recognized as, as hell was, um, you know, uh, in a, in the rational way I was going, if I can't, um, get some help and get this together, I'm either going to get addicted to something quite quickly, um, or I'm going to commit suicide. Like it was just, uh, I, I recognized this completely unsustainable. And at, at the time I didn't have really any education about some of like the therapeutic modalities that were out there that could help me. I had been in talk therapy for like 15 years and knew like, this isn't a talk therapy thing. That's not going to help me at this point. So it was really like this hopelessness and despair. And my first confrontation with like, Oh, this is, this is why people end up committing suicide. You know, it wasn't like a choice. It was like, I had this, um, I don't know, like if you were being electrocuted, you know, at some point you're just going to say mercy kind of thing. Um, And so there was that happening psychologically and then just on a spiritual level. um, I I describe it as hell in that it was God was not there. Whatever, um, you know, vision I had or um, projection of God that was there in my mind, it was this realization that this did not exist. Um, so, you know, whatever I thought might have happened or some being that was going to intervene or reach out to me in that moment, um, wasn't there. And that just felt like devastating to my soul. It just felt like being untethered out in space or something like this. Um, And so, yeah, on the flip side, which I I couldn't see now, it, it initiated this self-responsibility, you know, no one's coming to save me. So I need to help myself (laughs) um, kind of thing. So um, we called 911 and the emergency response team that showed up um, opened the door and immediately I recognized the person as a transgender person and as a conservative evangelical, you know, in my worldview, it was, I'm the Christian with all of the answers that's supposed to be like bestowing truth on the lost. And, you know, at that point in my life, someone who was transgender, it was like, well, you're clearly lost. You know, um, I have answers. You're lost. And so I, I was, I was fearful in that moment because there wasn't this trust of, it wasn't that there were two equals here, you know, this person here to help me, I needing help. It was always, I'm supposed to be reaching out and helping or saving people like you. And so I noticed this resistance in myself to receive help or to trust someone that I had, you know, preconceived notions about 
or I had a superiority complex about, you know, due to like my Christian worldview. Um, and as she started speaking to me, it was suddenly like the presence of what I would call Christ just started emanating off of her. And it was um, time kind of fell away. And I just felt really um, encapsulated in this bubble of like safety and um, what I would call like eternity. It was just a very thick saturation of um, presence. And so this was the, this is the mystical experience that I describe in the book um, where, you know, it was like this stake got put down in my life where I knew this was the most real moment or real experience of Christ that I've ever had. I was certain about that. And that threw everything else about my theology into question. Mm. So uh, I'll stop there, but that was, that's the background to how we got to where I, where I started my journey. Amazing. Yeah. And that's really, I mean, you mentioned this in the book, I mean, the parallel came to mind. I think it would have come to mind if you hadn't put it in the book, but um, you talk about um, not that I want to compare Saint, you know, a leper with a transgender person, but uh -huh. you've got the story of St. Francis where he is confronted with Christ coming to him in the form of someone that he would have rejected in yeah. his time, you know, the, 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 the leper on the road. And I think in the story you relate it, don't you, how, Francis embraces him and kisses him or something and then looks mm -hmm. around and then that they're gone. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, obviously the story that we might get from looking at the, sto the sources on St. Francis might be a bit different um, than yours, but there's that kind of, nevertheless, that kind of crisis moment. Yes. Something, something's not going to go on and be the same. Right. Yeah. Well, and I yeah. think what you're describing is an encounter with the other where, mm. you know, it, in society, but, you know, unless, unless you've had an encounter with a quote unquote, the other, we all have our others, you know, even for people who are consider themselves very accepting, you know, and like, I love everyone or, or whatever mm. it's, I've noticed probably their others are the conservative Christians, exactly. you know? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's like, I love everyone except for I hate those people who don't love everyone, you know? Yeah, yeah. I and, always imagine like, you know, if, if Jesus was telling the story of the, the, the Good Samaritan to progressive liberal, it would be the and the, the conservative Baptist evangelical came down the road and put him yes. on a donkey and took him to the inn. Yeah, the same point being. Okay. Yes, yes, yeah. where we have these societal hierarchies where mm. it's, you know, at least I'm not like those people or, you know, um, we don't treat everyone with full and equal dignity. And I think a lot of times that, you know, when we say like everyone's human, everyone um, deserves to be treated with dignity, most of the time we're, we're saying that about, and rightfully so, about a marginalized group, you know, there's there's good qualities in this marginalized person. There's human qualities, like we should have compassion, we should elevate. But I think also part of humanizing and giving full dignity to people is understanding that we all have the capacity to act cruel, act violent, act bigoted, especially when your worldview is situated in fear, you know? So I love, um, you know, the perspective of C.S. Lewis or someone like like that, who, who basically says, if you were saddled with a certain unhealthy psychological worldview and your whole nervous system was wired based on that fearful outlook on life, and then you were surrounded with people who applauded you for, you know, acting out those fears and projecting and dominating and, and all of this, you know, and he even names, you know, like, Himmler, who was associated with Hitler or some terrorist group or, or whatever, like people who we are very quick um, to, to judge. He's saying, if you, if you were saddled with that same psychological outfit and in the same environment, don't be so quick to think that you wouldn't act exactly like that person. Mm. And so I think that, that that is part of humanizing people is understanding when people are 
traumatized, they do insane things. And so if you're not doing insane things, well, lucky for you, you know, that you yeah. didn't grow up in the same circumstance, you know? So, yeah. um, so anyways, but yeah, to your point, I think what you're describing about the leper or my experience of the transgender person or that good Samaritan story where like a progressive person might, you know, be helped out by someone who's conservative and quote unquote bigoted or whatever. It's, it's mm. seeing the other, you know, the person that we've elevated ourselves above suddenly, you know, becoming our equal. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, and you, this, and what is it? I, yeah, I'm just connecting this up a little bit in my head as well. Like in terms of what do you think it is the connection between encountering the other, if you like, that causes something of a transcendent experience because you felt this kind of thick presence of mm -hmm. Christ, you're saying. And I'm just wondering if there's something about that it had to be mm -hmm. someone like this trans transgender woman mm -hmm. um, for you to have that. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I, yeah, I, yeah. Oh, that's I'm a great question. Really clearly. Yeah. yeah, that's a great question. I think it was a combination of one, my like utter vulnerability in the moment, um, because really just an hour before was this visceral experience of hell um, where, I, yeah, it just felt like lights out um, in a very dark, um, fearful way. Um, the falling away, you know, the, the death of God moment. Um, I didn't have the language for that at the moment at that time, but mm. that's what it was, you know, um, ar archetypally speaking, you know, the, why have you forsaken me kind of moment? It was like that, that image of God died. Um, and so I, I was just coming off of that, um, and so, yeah, it was really the most vulnerable moment I, I had in my life. And then the encounter with the other was, um, I think it was, it made me pay attention. It was like this snap into the now where suddenly I, my mental processes um, were arrested really. It was just like, there's, there's no like box or context for this. And so suddenly like all the rationalizing, you know, that I'm doing in my head is gone and you're, you're, you wake up essentially into the mm. present moment. Um, mm. And so I think that those two things combined was, you know, my own suffering making me um, vulnerable enough and ready for for this and then the surprise it was an element of surprise which you know brings you into um the now which now i feel like anytime you can fully be in the now you're going to encounter you know what i'm calling this mystical presence or this benevolence um you know so some people will work this out through like a meditation practice or something like that um but, you know, in Eastern traditions, they might call what I experienced, I think it's called like Satori, where it's mm -hmm. just like a sudden like awakening into mm -hmm. the present moment. And essentially you realize I've been asleep this whole time or I've been dreaming. Um, and it's really due to the fact that we just live in our head the whole time. You know, this, my head is the only source of intelligence, the only point of reference that I have for making sense of the world. And you don't even know that there's anything else besides that. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So it's interesting. Um, I refer to this in the book, but the whole Adam and Eve myth, you know, Adam goes to sleep and it never says that he wakes up. So I've we have noticed that, that before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And it's sleep as I was. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. and it's a perfect parallel yeah. to, um, you know, what happens to, I think everybody psychologically is you, you fall asleep to the other sources of intelligence in your body, you know, your soul, your spirit, um, even your, your bodily awareness, you know, your ability to sense what's happening in your body. 
it all becomes this mind game. And from this, you know, sleep or dreamlike state where we're only in our mind, this is what causes really all of our problems, you know, um, because the mind can only think in duality. It can only be right or wrong, good or evil, you know, uh, good and bad, bad guys. So even in our encounters with other people, it's very tribalistic because our tribe always has to be the elevated one, you know, someone always has to be going to heaven or going to hell. Or if you don't believe in that, it's like, you know, we're the you know, we're the gracious, compassionate, you know, humanizing group. And, you know, this other group, uh, you know, are the oppressors that are, are horrible and are making it awful for everyone, you know? So yeah. there, there's all, it always has to be divided up in, in some kind of way when you're just in your head. Yeah. And I guess in, in a sense, what I was just thinking of what you described there and what happened to you, it's kind of like you've got a whole construct, haven't you, of mm -hmm. the way you saw the world and by encountering something um, a radically different experience where the person that you would traditionally have thought of as the outsider or the outsider mm -hmm. to the kind of true meaning and reality of, of of life and the cosmos or what have you in that Christian worldview is the very person that's the person that's mediating yes that to you and that you're then it's a kind of collapse there's a collapse of that mm -hmm. story mm -hmm. um which then I guess is going to mean you're going to have to reconstruct something different. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, so we'll come back to that maybe in a bit because we, we, we're going to talk, I guess, about sort of the true and the false self, which mm -hmm. you talk about, I think is a, a major sort of pillar of, of the book. Um, so I wonder if we just get into kind of the idea of myth a little bit, because that's kind of, um, a central aspect in how you approach the Bible. Obviously, so we're thinking of this, you know, that I'm just, I'm, I was kind of wondering when I was putting this together, you know, how soon do I mention Bible in the mm -hmm. in, this, in this talk? Because I was imagining in a straight away the amount of people that would just switch off, you know, because mm -hmm. it's, it's such a loaded term, even word like God, the Bible, Jesus, Christianity, mm -hmm. are kind of so loaded with cultural meanings, aren't they? Yeah. That, um, are often quite negative for a lot of people in terms of their experience. And I think one of the great things that you do in the book is you offer a, a way in, which you sort of said at the beginning of the interview, you know, in a way to, to kind of reinvigorate this. Actually, there's mm -hmm. something really worth people reconsidering here and looking at in a, in a great, there's, there's much more depth to it yeah. than, that, than the church, perhaps particularly in our day and age has has sold to people so perhaps if i quote um the joseph campbell quote first of all where he talks about how people see the bible and then we'll, we'll use that as a segue into thinking about how you see the bible mm -hmm. um, in a new light so joseph campbell um who, who wrote half the people in the world think that the metaphors of their religious traditions for example are facts and the other half contends that they're not facts at all as a result, we have people who consider themselves believers because they accept metaphors as facts, and we have others who classify themselves as atheists because they think religious metaphors are lies. Um, so when we talk about the Bible as myth, um, perhaps you can kind of talk us through that a little bit and kind of what is the Bible for you and how do we get away from I guess on the one hand, people that are the kind of the literalists that only mm -hmm. deal with the text in a very narrow way. Mm -hmm. And then the kind of people that um, think, you know, the Bible's got nothing really to offer us anymore. It's just a, a mythic in that sense of the term, you know, legendary, mm -hmm. false, mm -hmm. untruthful text um, that should be relegated to the past. What's your kind of steer through the middle of this? Yeah. Well, um, yeah, it was interesting writing the book because I knew I knew that a lot of evangelicals were going to write it or excuse me, were going to read it. Mm. Um, and so I was, you know, I didn't I didn't even put myth on the back of the book, like nothing about the marketing or anything had that word in it because it's such a triggering word. Mm. You know, it either it, it means lie mm. to to a literalist or a fundamentalist and 
Um, and I can understand this, you know, coming from, from my context, when you have a sincerely held belief, you know, this is what you've based your entire life up off of, you know, this is what I made all my decisions. And I have this quote unquote personal relationship with God. And, you know, I'm a, a religious attender. So I, you know, in, in my context, it was, you know, very emotional worship services. My husband is, you know, a, a worship musician. He, he's a musician, you know, that's his vocation, but has, has participated in a lot of these worship services. And so to have, you know, to have someone come, come along and say like, well, it's all just a myth, you know, that that's very, that's very offensive to people. Um, and so I can understand that. And so um, making my way into what, what myth was and trying to, um, to explain it as uh, not a lie, but something, uh, a portal into a deeper truth is the function of, of what it is. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, when we're talking about God or reality or some of these, um, you know, the natural laws of the universe and th these kind of things, these are invisible, intangible concepts that we're talking about. And so um, I try to explain myth as, you know, metaphor that should not be taken literally like something we would see on CNN or something like that. It's, it's symbolic of a deeper truth, you know. It's um, a doorway that's meant to pull us through. And so um, for me, when I was, you know, in having that hellish experience, what was interesting to me, I had no context for this. You know, I had, I had not read any Joseph Campbell or Carl Jung or none of this was of any interest to me. It was, you know, it was me in the church trying to be a good Christian and live out my life and then having my own little neurotic things from time to time, which I would go to counseling for, you know, that was, that was <laughs> kind of it. Um, but when when I was in quote unquote hell, I immediately recognized it as the belly of the whale. Like that is the metaphor that came to my mind um, was going, this is where Jonah was. I just knew that. Um, so it was interesting to me that that illumination came to me before I had any context for myth or had done any like academic study about it. Mm -hmm. I knew um, that this psychological space was the belly of the whale. Um, so it was a, it was very experiential for me where I realized that, um, I had the metaphorical language to understand where I was, the purpose of the place that I was in, um, you know, the, the revelations and the personal traumas that I was dealing with. Um, as painful as they were, I knew that they were um, the truth about my life. I knew that what was old was dying. I didn't know what was coming next, but it felt um, it felt meaningful and purposeful. I knew that I that I had to walk forward through dealing with this stuff. Um, and if I didn't, you know, for me, I felt literally my life and you know my children were on the line in terms of their mother being okay. So um, f for me, I, j I just understood the metaphor. I didn't, e I didn't even call it myth at that point. It wasn't until later on um, where I came across the work of Joseph Campbell that I understood, oh, okay, this is what this is called. Um, but I was encountering the study of myth um, from uh, like a very experiential context. So I think that this is why I absorbed it so quickly is it was just giving language to something that I already knew, you know, like that's exactly what I experienced. I, I understand exactly what he's saying. So it wasn't something that I was trying to wrap my mind around. It almost was like a relief, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. like, oh, okay, finally there's one person, you know, he's not alive anymore, but there's someone on this planet who understands the experience that I had and is naming it for me. Um, so I, 
yeah, it's interesting just even in terms of my own learning and, you know, I, I went to college, you know, I, I took some of these class and it's just like, it just didn't hit me. It just didn't absorb, um, at all really until I was living out my own experience of the function of mythology. All of a sudden it was like, oh, I got it, you know, <laughs> like very fast. Um, so anyway, uh, yeah, so that that was my uh, the first point of reference was the Jonah and the whale story, and 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 realizing, okay, this cognitive dissonance that I've been holding on to about you know if you believe in God, you know that that's tethered to believing all of these things literally. They don't make any rational sense, you know. Uh, it's hard to believe, you know. But but in my context, literally, you know, we'd be in homeschool groups or something like this. And, you know, people would be trying to like, quote unquote, prove how some of these ridiculous things could be scientifically possible, you know? So that was kind of the trail that I was on. You know, I have so much faith in God that I have to like, uh, you know, wrangle my mind into believing something ridiculous when in, in actuality, it's like, no, that never had, you know? <laughs> so yeah. anyways, not even just in terms of like uh, my religious beliefs, but just the way that I was able to encounter the world in a very practical way uh, totally opened up for me because I wasn't having to force my mind to believe, you know, ridiculous things anymore. Anyway, all that to say is, um, and this will maybe get into the true and false self part a little bit, but during this whole awakening experience, it did feel like something inside me woke up, which in the book I call the true self. And it, it felt like my, my essence, my essential quality, the most real part of myself um, woke up and it felt new and fresh. And also this recognition that had always been there. Um, I had just been asleep to it. And so when that woke up, um, I started um, I started seeing this awakening experience and psychologically speaking, the different points in the process, I saw that all as being reflected symbolically in the stories. So I think very quickly, all of the Old Testament, stuff, you know, the stuff that just seemed larger than life, you know, very quickly, I was reinterpreting it through, um, you know, as metaphor, as symbolism, as myth for this real time process that I was experiencing. Mm -hmm. um, and so then, you know, the tricky part, I think, for anyone who um, is coming out of evangelicalism, or even is in a progressively Christian space, is, well, what do we do with Jesus? You know, is Jesus, it's, I think it's easy to, to get to, okay, all the Old Testament stuff, we're not taking that literally, we can absorb that as myth. Um, and then Jesus gets a little more dicey, you know, mm. oh, what, you know, what if that's, what if that's just a myth? You know, what if that wasn't real um, kind of thing? And for me, when you, once I understood the power of myth um, and how that was really like the highest reading of the text, everything else just be kind of came, it became secondary to me mm. Um, mm. where, you know, the literalism of the story, the, the myth part was so powerful and immediately um, relevant and effective for my life that, all the historicity in the literal part got just very boring to me. It was like, I don't have to spend any more energy thinking about that. I don't really care either way. If, you know, if, if some of the Jesus story was literal or not, he's much more fascinating to me as a human being now who underwent a similar process or, not similar who underwent this process. Yeah. Um, and you know, if, if someone were to come along and 
and prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that he wasn't real, it wouldn't change anything for me. Like the mythology of his life was so viscerally relevant and true that I'm good with it, you know? So, interesting. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Maybe come back to that in a minute when we talk about, perhaps talk about your idea of Christ in, in, in a yep. bit more detail. Um, but it was interesting because I, I remember I was thinking, I was remembering back to my theological training when I was reading the book on preparing for today. Mm -hmm. and I, I was thinking of uh, the whole thing of, you know, biblical interpretation, hermeneutics and, mm -hmm. and so on. And um, just remembered the, um, the history of the church really placing a lot more emphasis in the past, not on the literal understandings, but also on the, you know, the allegorical and the, mm -hmm. and, and the, the mythical in that, in that, in that sense. And, um, and I think a lot of evangelicals probably on conservative modern Christians, but also their opponents in a, in a sense as well, that the skeptics and the atheists forget that this is, you know, they might hear you and think, Oh, you're just, you're just being kind of like a bit kind of, you know, postmodern or you're trying to kind of re, do things for the contemporary world but this goes right back as a as a tradition so i origin in the whenever whichever century it was you know talking about you know needing to understand exactly what you just said a minute ago actually the what was it the the, the flesh the soul and the spirit of scripture mm -hmm. and to get that right because if we there are things he, he sort of says that if we you know miss if we kind of take certain things literally that are, are just impossible just certain impossible things in the Old Testament, for example, we're going to come a cropper in making sense of that. Right. Um, and yeah. That goes right the way back. And, and I was thinking, like, you know, yeah, even Paul in the New Testament, you know, talks about, um, uses the Abraham and Hagar and Sarah story in an allegorical way. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they're doing that. Jesus, you know, like the Jonah, Jonah and the whale, you talked about a minute ago, you know. Yeah. As, you know, the son of man will be, you know, the only sign I'm going to give you will be, the son of man will be i can't remember what it was three days in the belly of the whale and yes it, it'll be the sign of jonah which it's yeah. is so interesting because you read that and it just it's funny the questions that you don't ask when you don't have the awareness to ask them mm. um <clears throat> you know i've heard a, an interpretation of that to mean well jesus believed jonah got swallowed by a whale so it must be true and now i'm like no, 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 he didn't. You know, he's 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 saying mythologically or allegorically or metaphorically, you're going to see this sign of, you know, of nothing, basically. Like, <laughs> there's, no, there's no sign. It's just this disappearance um, or this, you know, life, death, resurrection kind of thing. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um but yeah, it, in my view, he's using it allegorically. And, it, and if you take it literally, it's like, why why at this, you know, really poignant moment is he talking about this guy being swallowed by a fish for three days? That it doesn't make any sense if you take it literally, you know? Yeah. And yeah. so I do understand, <clears throat> excuse me, I do understand the... Um, yeah, the, the visceral reaction, you know, from an atheist or someone like, because it's ridiculous if, if you if you try to interpret it literally. Um, yeah, but what what's what I find to be unfortunate, I guess, is is when we can't get past it um, to understand like the, the deeper wisdom or meaning. And, you know, again, you as a, as a psychotherapist, it's like this, this process is essential for people to find healing and um and beauty and truth in their lives so if we if we can't get past the cynicism of how the literal interpretation has you know <laughs> mm. served us so so poorly then we can't get on with with the healing that you know individuals in our world like desperately need so mm. yeah yeah yeah, and you've got this idea, haven't you, of, the, sort of the, these deep archetypal patterns and, and themes and tropes that run through not just the Bible, but other literature as well, you know. Um, and so these these stories like, I don't know, um, the flood stories and so mm -hmm. on, they, 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 they crop up time and time again around the world, you know. Um, 
jo- I guess Joseph Campbell and C- Cole Young certainly would have seen that in a mm-hmm. in the sense that these are stories that are deeply rooted in our psyche. They're telling when we tell these stories that, 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 that there's something yes. deep within us that's being expressed, like the archetypal mother and you know the um, and so on. So yeah, and, and I guess on that note. Um, although I know, I know I'm missing a, I want to pick, pick something back up that you mm-hmm. said a minute ago as well, because I, I don't want to miss that, that healing element as well. But you know, that, um, to what extent do you, would you sort of say, um, again, we're thinking of our evangelical kind of confrères in the back of our mind here, but, um, to what extent would you say, and you raised this a minute ago with, with, with regard to Jesus, didn't you? Mm-hmm. But to, to what extent would you say we, need to keep hold of the historical if you like as well um so i mean i think what what you're saying is that and i I totally agree with you is that very often people miss the richness and the life giving the depth Mm -hmm. of these texts because they're only reading them on a surface level Mm -hmm. very often you know um but you raised that question, you know, what do we do when it comes to Jesus? It gets a bit more awkward because we're like, okay, well, did he exist? Did he did mm-hmm. he walk the earth or not? Whether he whether or not he turned water into wine, maybe slightly, you know, here or there. But you know, um, how do you how do you think of that, Heather? In terms of within your how how you kind of resolve that within yourself? Yeah, well, I think it's interesting that you brought up that water into wine. Actually, one of the someone who read the book early on. Um, who was a progressive Christian and uh, really didn't, he didn't like it very much. And, you know, he was expressing his critique. And um, one of the things that he said in terms of, you know, you're reading, you're reading myth into this too much. And um, something he said was like, you know, he said, we know Jesus turned water into wine. Are you saying that's a myth also? And for me, it was interesting just how easily, He's, he declared that we know, mm. do we, you yeah. know, I'm like, <laughs> I don't know if I agree with the premise of that. And there's symbolically speaking, there's so much richness in the picture of turning water into wine from a, like a psychological alchemical process. And it was interesting because in the book, I, I talk a little bit about that, about how you know, even the Red Sea, the the water being saturated red, is symbolic of um, the blood of Christ, or psycho from a psychological lens, um, like the psychic lifeblood, which is um, you know kind of what I experience, like my uh, aliveness. Um, you can maybe help me out with some terminology here, but it it was like. Uh, yeah, like, it was like this psychic (laughs) bloodlet, where all of a sudden, I felt like psychologically, emotionally, physically, everything was saturated with aliveness. Um, And I and I think that that was first a a psychological phenomenon that happened. Like once the, the pipe started to get straightened out, and it was like the water or spirit could flow through um that that's what the red sea or the blood of christ is symbolizing is like this new life this new saturation with um Mm. new psychic energy essentially so Mm. anyway the the turning water into wine um at the wedding feast to me that screams of you know symbolism yeah so I, I think I think instead of getting like caught up in the weeds of like, well, you know, was there actually a wedding? You know, was Jesus actually there? Was it, you know, mm. um, it, it's just kind of boring to me to like argue those details because the real juiciness of it is in the psychological allegory you know, and how, and how these things can be used in our own internal healing and to bring us to new life. Yeah. So, um, so I think that that's kind of how I reconcile it is I just don't think about the historicity that much or the details of it, because 
the mythological reading is so much more rich and useful for us. Um, and, you know, again, growing up in the church my whole life, I've, I've heard people arguing about this ad nauseum. And it doesn't really seem to, like, change anything or get us any get us anywhere. Yeah. Um, so for, for me, it was actually quite a relief to be able to give myself permission to just stop analyzing it so much. I, I think I came to the conclusion that I was never going to um, feel certain about it, you know, um, yeah. and I didn't feel like I needed to anymore. And so it's interesting now because I think about these stories way more than I did when I was an evangelical Christian, even though that was, you know, quote unquote, what, what I was thinking about all the time, I guess, but, or I would have told myself I was, but I, I just think about the metaphor and the mythology so much now, even when I'm dealing with other people, even if they don't uh, ascribe to myth or whatever, you know, I might be listening to some situation or, and, and I can, I can just put them on the map, you know, in terms of where they are in their own mythological journey. And then that's helpful to me to be able to, you know, meet them there and maybe give a word of encouragement for where they are, as opposed to, you know, just offering some advice to try to fix it. There's, you have access to more wisdom knowing where someone is on the map. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's kind of like living in that. Oh, I remember, I remember, I was doing my theology, my theology degree, and it was some, it was something. It was long. It was about ten, twelve years ago. Mm -hmm. long ago. But it was like um, stuff around this kind of scriptural, cos cosmological view and world. This, this, uh, the scri scripture for the Jewish people, particularly, not just in the past but today as well, being your kind of your language. Mm -hmm in which you do life so you know and it's kind of like maybe by quibbling about whether the actual jesus actually went to cana and turned this it's, it's, it's kind of yeah it's, it's like looking at a great painting isn't it it's like looking at a great rembrandt and going hmm you wonder what where he actually got that red paint from you know and, and yeah that, in there what date exactly did he actually paint that and were the characters all actually in that actual street it's like no no yes. exactly like, yes okay maybe maybe in certain things it might still be relevant mm -hmm. in terms of like maybe i don't know we do need a certain minimal facts that jesus doesn't need to have existed i don't know maybe the resurrection i don't know we mm -hmm. can get into that um but it's like still missing the the rich like the impact of the painting and, and mm -hmm. you know that so yeah I guess that's how that comes across yeah. to me. Well, and what's interesting to me, this is it might be deviating a little bit, but um, mm. you know, I've had I've had dreams about Jesus where like Jesus the man has been in my dream, you know. I've had dreams about um, you know, um uh, my grandmother who I love very much. She's she still pops up in my dreams at when I need her to be there, um, to tell me something ab about my life. And it's interesting. It, it just happened like a few days ago, um, preceding like, um, a really delicate conversation that I was going to have my, my grandma. And I was like, okay, like it gave me this ease that there was like purpose and, um, yeah, so something, some deep truth that was going to be unfolding, like in the conversation that I had. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think about that and I'm like, was that literally my grandma who showed up in my dream, you know? And it's interesting when I have these kind of dreams, it's like, I can see her as pristinely as if she were here, you know, like the, um, the wrinkles on her skin or the discoloration, you know, stuff that I, ca that I can't even remember in my waking life. Like where were the little dark spots on her skin or the jewelry that she was wearing. Like I can't, I cannot pull that up as accurately in my waking life as I see it in my dream. Like that's how real it is. And so I wake up and I'm like, was that literally my grandma that was there? Or was it some deeply, deeply 
imprinted uh, feminine archetype in my psyche that presents itself to me as my grandma, this maternal, you know, the maternal part of the feminine. Hmm. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but I know when it happens, I listen to it. So I think that that is, it's kind of the same thing um, with Jesus, you know, like the, when that has come to me in a dream, you know, is the Jesus I'm seeing the same face that you would see if you dreamt of Jesus, you know, like we could probably find some discrepancies, you know, how long was your Jesus's hair? You know, mine's, <laughs> my guy comes here, you know, but it's still, it's this, um, figure that's carrying something that is, I think, the most deeply visceral real thing. Like, it's, like, so real that we can't even, um, like, lock it in to a literalness, you know? Um, mm -hmm. It's a little more, I'm, I don't know what the word is, like, a little more vapory than that, you know? Yeah, so yeah. that that's the very interesting part of it for me is it's not... I don't have um, a cynical view of Jesus, you know, it's not that never happened. I don't believe it. Anything like that. It's like, no, whatever this presence is, Christ, I think has been showing up since the beginning of time. In so thanks for listening so far. This interview is continued in part two in the next video. Please join us there.